Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started and people can just kind of file in. Um, we have over 150 people in so far, so this is a pretty popular session. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, we're here for the final question and answer session. So we'll address whatever questions have come up at, at meetings before, any additional questions that you have, we'll address those in this session. First, I'd like to introduce our speakers, which you've probably seen many of them before, um, but we have uh, Dr. Michael Tuttle. I'm sure you're very familiar with Dr. Tuttle. He, he's been around a while, um, lucky, lucky for us. He's an endocrinologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Center, Cancer Center in New York and a professor of medicine at the Joan and um, Sanford Weill, Sanford I. Wheel Medical College of Cornell University. He is an active clinician and researcher specializing in the management of advanced thyroid cancer. He travels extensively both within the US and abroad, lecturing on the difficult management issues in thyroid cancer. Dr. Tull's research projects in radiation-induced thyroid cancer have taken him from Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands to the Hanford nuclear power plant in Washington state to regions in Russia that were exposed to fallout from the Chernobyl accident. He served on the American Thyroid Association Committee that produced the current guidelines for the management of benign and malignant thyroid nodules. He also chaired the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Thyroid Cancer Panel and served on the Endocrinologic and, and Metabolic Advisory Committee of the US Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Tuttle is a FICA medical advisor. And we also have Dr. Harari. Um, she is an endocrine surgeon and associate professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, David Geffen School of Medicine, Los Angeles, California. Dr. Harari's clinical and research interests include the multidisciplinary management of benign and malignant tumors of the adrenal, thyroid, and parathyroid glands as well as neuroendocrine pancreas. She is also interested in familial endocrine disorders such as multiple endocrine neoplasia. She offers a wide range of unique services, including retroperitoneal or transabdominal laparoscopic adrenal adrenalectomy, sorry, I'm butchering this, mini incision thyroid and parathyroid surgery, central and modified neck dissection and laparoscopic removal of pancreatic tumors. Dr. Harari is an expert in thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal surgery. She's performed over 2,000 endocrine surgical procedures from the simplest parathyroid surgery to the most complicated open paraganglioma surgeries. Welcome. Um, also like to welcome Dr. Mabel Ryder. She is an endocrinologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, she received her MD from the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. Dr. Ryder is a recipient of a Thyca Thyroid Research Grant. Um, she also happens to be my daughter's endocrinologist, so welcome, glad to have you here. Um, and Dr. Lori Wirth, she is a medical oncologist and associate professor of medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center and Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Her research focuses on new treatments for RET-driven correlates of treatment responses for aggressive differentiated thyroid cancer that is resistant to radioactive iodine and related areas. She is past president of the International Thyroid Oncology Group and she is a FICA medical advisor. Um, so thank you everybody so much for being here. Um, we appreciate your time. And I know Dr. Tuttle, I think he's gonna kind of take it away and moderate the session. Fantastic. I thought it would take a few minutes to get questions, but as usual, FICA folks are overachievers. And we already have more questions that we can answer. So let's start a few at the top. Mabel, let's start with you. Um, the, we often use this term, don't worry that if you have low level detectable TGs, we're not gonna worry about it too much. And the question was, how low is low level? Uh, there are some people that can measure assays down to 0 0.01. So when you say low level thyroglobulins, what are you talking about, Mabel? Yeah, so usually we're talking, um, we have very sensitive assays and I think across the country they are now. So for me, things under five are fairly um, reassuring for me. And um, I also remind patients that low level with structural imaging that doesn't show much disease is what is re really reassuring. So when the levels climb above five um, on various assays, even on our own, then I begin looking for where the disease might be. 
And then if structurally I don't find anything, it's the change in time, the change in levels over time that also would prompt either not worrying and watching or further imaging. Very good. Uh, Dr. Harari, we're going to do like a potpourri. There's going to be no logic to this whatsoever. So this one says, how, how can we tell if I'm, if I'm in the middle of wherever country or world I am, that the imaging, the analysis, the ultrasound reports are reliable? You, you get a lot of people referred into you from outside UCLA. I, you know, you can't, can't always repeat everything at UCLA. How do, you, how do you kind of gauge if, no, maybe you can. How do you kind of gauge if those ultrasound reports are good or not good? Can you give us some idea about that? Yeah, you know, that's a good point. It's, it's variable what happens in the community. And I, especially when we're talking about thyroid cancer, um, it's really important that somebody has done a lymph node mapping. So lymph node mapping is key to, to preparing for the surgical excision. And you have to make sure that you're doing the complete surgical excision. I have had people come to me after their thyroid was removed where um, the lymph nodes weren't weren't looked at and the surgeon just removed the thyroid and did not remove the rest of the lymph nodes from the lateral and the central neck. And then I needed to go back in to do that, which as you know, in a scarred neck can sometimes increase your risk. So really making sure that the um, uh, report has to do, has both the thyroid and the lymph nodes in it. And then I actually do do an ultrasound on every single patient uh, because I have done this many, many years. So I do my own ultrasound. And, and then also the imaging is so important to actually, actually visualize. If you know how to visualize an image as a surgeon, you can tell if the cancer is you know, very lateral or is it really adherent to the trachea? Could it be involving your recurrent laryngeal nerve? Do you have bulky lymphadenopathy? Are they invading the muscles? So all of these things you can't really get from a report sometimes. So I actually do my own imaging. Um, I think that it's a, if you don't do your own image as a surgeon, then you really have to rely on the on the radiologist and how detailed they are. And if they're not so detailed in the, in the description, then, it, then perhaps either call the radiologist yourself if you're a surgeon or um, make sure that at least it's, it's, it's a comprehensive, including all the lymph nodes. And I think, I think for all of us, it's so much looking at the images, right? It's not just reading yeah. a report, it's looking at the outside plus doing your own. Um, Dr. Worth, uh, there were several questions about where we are now with redifferentiation agents and the old Salumetinib trial. And, you know, is that, is that really working or where we are in that redifferentiation story, Lori? Oh boy, I, I really love the idea of redifferentiation. And, and I think the, the idea of it came about because we do have effective systemic therapies like lenvatinib for people with iodine refractory um, differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, but many patients have a relatively low volume of disease growing slowly and not causing them any symptoms. So lenvatinib kind of seems like a heavy duty drug um, for that particular setting. Um, so, so, you know, there've been a number of groups and studies that have looked at um, targeting the abnormalities um, that we see frequently in these cancers in the MAP kinase pathway that we know are related to the loss of thyroid cancer cells being able to take up um, and concentrate radioactive iodine. Um, so uh, uh, Mike and his group at, at Memorial really took a lead um, early on at, at uh, doing the first redifferentiation studies with selumetinib. There now have been two trials that have been published. One was uh, done in the um, after thyroid cancer surgery setting before patients who had intermediate risk disease or higher risk disease got ran got uh, treated with radioactive iodine. Um, so they were randomized to get selumetinib plus radioactive iodine versus radioactive iodine alone. So that study was unfortunately a negative study, um, but we actually learned a lot from it. Um, the, um, um, there, is no other large randomized trial that's underway right now. So I think that we're unfortunately kind of far away from the time when redifferentiation has a possibility for becoming a bona fide standard of care therapy with FDA approval. Um, nonetheless, there are a lot of um, interesting um, efforts underway to try to figure out how do we um, um, target the BRAF mutations that so many thyroid cancers have or the RAS mutations that so many thyroid cancers have to trick those thyroid cancers into taking up radioactive iodine. 
I think we are going to be making progress. I think the challenge will be how to figure out um, how we can study those strategies in a definitive way. Um, hopefully, we'll also be taking advantage of some of the newer um, targeted therapies as well, such as targeting the RET fusions that we see um, in a subset of, of uh, papillary thyroid cancers. Um, there should be a, an ITOG trial underway um, sometime within a year or so from now that we'll be taking a look at targeting um, RET-driven uh, thyroid cancers when, they, when they're iodine refractory with one of the RET specific inhibitors to see if that works. So um, there's a lot of interesting research that's being done, um, but unfortunately nothing that is about to turn to, into standard of care right around the corner. It's uh, amazing to see that field transition. Dr. Harari, here's a surgical question. Um, as usual, a really good question. Um, how are central compartment lymph nodes assessed during surgery if you're not actually doing frozen section, if you can't see them on, on ultrasound. You know, we talk about the importance of risk stratification. So talk a little bit about how you assess those central neck lymph nodes. Sure. So in the clinic um, on ultrasound, obviously, uh, if you see one, that that's important. You know, um, we I try to hyperextend my patients as much as possible in the clinic so I can sort of visualize a little bit of the central neck, but the trachea makes it difficult on ultrasound to see really well. So when we're in the, um, when, when we're in surgery, it's really just palpation and making sure that there's no grossly positive lymph nodes. It hasn't been shown that the recurrence rate is higher if you have mic even microscopic disease that you can't see either on an ultrasound or grossly um, visually in the operating room that the recurrence rate is any higher, at least in, in, that, um, in, in the studies that, uh, that have been done. But if you do have lateral lymph nodes that are already involved, then we then we go ahead and take out the central neck, regardless of if it's grossly positive or not, or, or positive on the ultrasound or not, because we know that typically majority of them will go to the central neck before they go to the lateral neck. So there's, it's not a hard science, but certainly if we see something on the ultrasound, then we'll, sometimes it's not even a positive lymph node. It's, it's just a reactive lymph node. Many people have Hashimoto's and thyroid cancer. And so those, sometimes I will send for frozen section. And if they're negative, we might not do a full central neck dissection. Central neck dissections, you know, they don't come without risk. So it's important to weigh the benefits and the risk when you're, when you're approaching it surgically. Fantastic. Um, Mabel, there are several questions about long-term follow-up. And I, I assume these are people that have an excellent response, however they were treated. Um, and the question's like, what do I do five years, 10 years down the road? Do you really need an ultrasound? Do you keep doing TGs? Um, what TSH goals? So can you talk about presumably low to intermediate risk that have an excellent response? And now we're sort of in that long-term follow-up. What's, what's that follow-up look like for you? Yeah. So I think, Mike, you know, we follow from a, a lot of the data that you have published and have shown about um, excellent response to treatment. And when after three to five years um, with or without radioactive iodine remnant ablation, if their thyroglobulin is negative and if a neck ultrasound is negative, the risk for recurrence thereafter is probably less than two to 3%. And with that information, we tend to, after three to five years here at Mayo Clinic in our thyroid cancer survivorship program, uh, let patients know that we, um, their follow-up is generally once a year neck exam, a TSH and a thyroglobulin. And after three to five years, if they've met that excellent response, we stop doing ultrasound unless clinically indicated. And importantly, as we've backed up in the field from doing overly aggressive treatments um, for low-risk thyroid cancers, we ensure that their TSH is not suppressed to less than 0.1. And we let the TSH you know, be anywhere from 0.1 up to 2, 2.5 range long-term. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Rari, there was a question um, about um, scars healing after surgery, and in particular uh, from uh, patients that are uh, likely to get keloid scars. Can you, I mean, those can be frustrating or any, any kind of bad scar. I mean, I know it never happens to surgeons at UCLA, but assume, <laughs> assuming this surgery was done someplace else, what, what can you tell us about the scars and making them pretty and that sort of stuff? Okay. Well, um, if you can plan as a surgeon to sort of put a scar in one of the creases, a lot of times that will really help with um, uh, hiding the scar inside of a crease. Um, I also you you know don't I also glue my incisions so that there's no stitch in the last layer. So sometimes that's a, a better healing. Um, also, those people who tend to keloid, um, you know, I always ask 
the patient, if they've had surgery before, let me see your scar. It kind of gives me a sense of what's happening in the neck. And if they're, they do tend to keloid, I do have to tell them, you know, there is a risk for keloid, a pretty high risk for keloid. The things we try to do to try and prevent it from at least getting worse or mm, severe is to inject with Kenalog during the surgery. That's a steroid that kind of quells the hyperinflammatory state that can cause the keloiding, but even that may not prevent it completely. And then sometimes if you start seeing it come, even after you've done that, uh, you can continuously con inject Kenalog uh, every month, every, every few weeks, and see if that can prevent uh, it from, from forming and maybe even regressing. And that doesn't work. There are other things you can do. You can re-excise, but that might, you know, it might recur even after you've excised it again. Um, or there's some dermatological things, laser treatments that, that, that can help. So I think um, trying to plan on all of those things uh, will, will help for the best possible scar. Hi, Dr. Tuttle, this is Pam Mendenhall, a moderator. I'm wondering if I could get a quick question in. Sure, Pam. That's okay with you. Um, my daughter had follicular thyroid cancer when she was 10, um, and my other daughter and husband had thyroid adenomas, and through genetic testing about 14 years ago on all three of them, we found a P10 germline mutation classified as a variant of uncertain significance. So the last two weeks, we found out my husband also tested positive for a DICER-1 germline mutation. Um, so my girls have yet to be tested, but assuming that they do have this second mutation, how do we know what caused their thyroid cancer in nodules, whether it's the P10 or the DICER-1, or maybe that's an impossible question. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I always try to be the moderator. That way I get to ask questions that nobody can answer. So Pam, Pam just assume that role. Uh, obviously an unusual situation. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody's ever going to really 100% know. Uh, the Dicer one's a relatively uh, new mutation that's been described in thyroid nodules and is associated with some unusual uh, tumors in kids. Um, it's one of these weird mutations that by the time we find the DICER-1 mutation in an adult, even if it's hereditary, if the adult hasn't developed any of those tumors, it seems like they probably don't. So it's one of those that they either develop in childhood or they don't. Um, when you get these multiple mutations, I, I don't know that we know which one would be the driver. Uh, Lori, any other, any other thoughts? You deal with these driver mutations on the sort of the aggressive end. Any thoughts about this? Yeah, so um, the so there are polymorphisms in 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 our genes um, that are that that are passed down from parent to child, and um, and those polymorphisms can be found in genes that we also know are related to cancer, but not necessarily have any import. Um, and so, um, usually. Um, if something is reported as a variant of uncertain significance, um, even though there's a, a variation there, like in the P10 gene, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's pathologic. Whereas if there's a DICER-1 mutation that's pathologic, um, and then the kids were found to have harbor that same mutation, it's probably more likely that 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 plays more of a of an of a physiologic role um, than the P10 mutation that's been described as a variant of uncertain significance. Thank you very much. Very good, um, Dr. Ryder. Then Dr. Ferrari. Um, the the topic for Jeopardy is active surveillance. Um, so Mabel, which, which patients in the papillary microcarcinoma would you think about following for active surveillance? And then the same way with Dr. Hurry, you're a surgeon. People come to you for a surgery um, and you're going to talk them out of a surgery. That, that should be a fun discussion. Uh, <laughs> Mabel, go first, and then we'll have Dr. Hurry talk about her experience. Yeah, perfect. So uh, thank you for the question. It's a very popular question. And so we see um, a wide variety of patients these days who come to us with um, even pushing the boundaries for papillary thyroid cancers, even up to two centimeters, can we do what are our treatment options? And so Mike, learning uh, you know, very heavily fortunate to be at Memorial and looking at your database as well as the database from Japan, um, certainly patients who are older, and I don't have a magic cutoff of what that age is, but certainly when I see 60, 70, 80 year olds with papillary microcarcinomas, what looks like a microcarcinoma on ultrasound, quite suspicious, but it's under a centimeter, we have a careful discussion of whether we even biopsy this understanding that it may be a papillary microcarcinoma, but that that prognosis of those patients are quite indolent um, and uh, the prognosis is excellent um, for the cancer. And 
sometimes I see patients who they sit down and the, they've already read the ultrasound report saying they have this suspicious nodule and they want to go straight to surgery. And actually after an hour long discussion about their, um, in their outcomes and that, that DVT that they had in PE for which they might be on a blood thinner is more at risk than this microcarcinoma, I'm able to, um, we're able to arrive at the right decision for them. So the short answer is in older patients, um, I um, tend to not necessarily want to biopsy these. I think once you put a needle and call it a cancer, it's sometimes harder to talk patients into just monitoring it. Younger patients, I would say in their 20s and 30s who are going to have lifelong surveillance of this, it might be a different scenario. And we try to arrive at with them, what's the best option for them? Whether is it, is it a low back to me or is it watching for a few years? So I'll chime in, it's my turn. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I have the same discussions as Dr. Ryder does with my patients. I, uh, you know, I, I don't want to perform surgery unnecessarily on somebody. And it's really important to find a surgeon who knows when to operate, when not to operate. Now, I think a lot of it has to do with, so active surveillance in, uh, assumes that you will be, sur there will be surveillance. So it means, that, you know, the patient it feels comfortable and, uh, and has a reliable physician and is, it also takes responsibility on themselves to be able to get the surveillance. So what is that every six months? Is it every year? You're going to follow it with ultrasounds. Um, I think also it has to do with what their background is. Do they have a background of being of radiation? You know, do they have a strong family history of thyroid cancer? Do they live in a place, you know, that environmentally is a little bit more aggressive, you know? So you have to have all of these discussions with the patient and then it, and then it, and arrive at a conclusion that kind of uh, both the physician and the patient are, are happy with. I think for me as a surgeon, obviously when they come to me, they're, they're looking for the surgical uh, point of view. And I tell them, you know, how, what's the surgery like? What will happen after the surgery? You know, what's the chance that they may require thyroid hormone, may not require thyroid hormone? What, you know, a lot of the surveillance, they'll have a discussion with their endocrinologist, but I'll kind of get into that as well. Um, and I think you just have to go through the pros and cons for each patient um, and decide that way. Obviously, the people who are, who will be able to be surveyed don't have lymph nodes that are positive, you know, don't have a, a thyroid cancer that's, again, stuck to the trachea or invading, you know, muscles, you know, even if it's seven millimeters, if it's, you know, locally invasive, that's a different cancer than a seven millimeter one that's right in the middle of a thyroid lobe and doesn't have any other, lymph, you know, nodules to worry about. So I think, you know, I have a lot of the same discussions and I give them the same options. Yeah, I mean, I think those are great discussions to have. I often, as Mabel says, some people just know they want surgery and some people know they want to watch. And the ones that are in the middle, I have the great fortune. I send to one of my surgeons and say, hey, tell them about surgery. We, we haven't decided we wanted it yet just because we're seeing you, but yeah. tell us about the risk and benefits where they get, they get both specs. Um, Lori, this one's for you. It's a great question. Uh, the example was sort of how do you know if uh, a multi-kinase inhibitors work? This is a thyroid globulin that dropped from 800 to 200, disease stability, but no further shrinkage, and has been on, for example, an NTRAC inhibitor for two years. So how do you judge success when you're using these TKIs? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, in general, you know, we think about um, um, success in several different ways. We think about how clinical trials define success and then um, what success means for an individual patient's life, and they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, with clinical trials, we think about um, has the cancer um, gotten smaller? Is there a partial response or a complete response? Um, and has it gotten smaller? That's That means by imaging, um, usually with on CT scans. Um, the, um, or it has the cancer um, not met the criteria for partial response, um, but also not progressed. And then those patients are considered to have stable disease. Or is the cancer growing in a meaningful way? And that's considered progressive disease. Generally, if a cancer is growing by 20% or more on CT scans, it, that's progressive d disease. And in oncology in general, if you are using a drug and the cancer is growing anywhere, that generally means that the, that the drug is not effective at controlling the cancer and we move on to something else. Um, however, if um, a, a cancer is remaining stable or, or getting smaller on a therapy that's generally fairly well tolerated, um, 
that's good. Um, if if somebody is on it has an NTREC fusion and and is on an NTREC inhibitor and it's generally well tolerated, and their cancer had been growing before starting the NTREC inhibitor and it's it's now um, um, responding somewhat on a drug that's well tolerated, that's a good situation and you don't want to mess with success. Now, I often will tell people the thing that we care the least about is what's happening with the tumor markers. Um, <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I just wish I could just eliminate tumor markers from my life altogether because really what's most important is how do you feel? Are you alive? And, 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 um, and, and is your cancer um, growing or not? Um, the tumor markers are the least important. But in, with um, differentiated thyroid cancer in general, thyroid globulin levels do tend to correlate with response to the drug. Um, and so tumor markers that are not increasing significantly, um, thyroid globulin is, that's not going up significantly is always a good thing. So I'm going to ask all three of you this one because this this is a really timely question that it starts with with the COVID-19 pandemic going on. Um, what do we tell people about our follow up? Mabel, let me let you uh, talk about it in terms of sort of follow up in the first year or two after diagnosis of thyroid cancer. Dr. Rory, talk about it in terms of timing for surgery, uh, either in primary recurrent setting. And then we'll ask Lori to talk about it in your patients that are either on drug or about to be on drug. Uh, maybe Mabel start. Yeah, so for me, it's been an interesting um, evolution, both in my endocrine practice and medical oncology practice, where I see low risk patients in endocrine primarily, and I see advanced patients in oncology. And so as the COVID pandemic came and Mayo Clinic for a short time sort of um, was on lockdown, it's my endocrine practice, fortunately, with my low risk patients, we were able to um, defer those patients' appointments and their um, anxieties about traveling and being exposed to the virus. Um, we were able to set up virtual visits, which mo pe most people did, but also reassure them that um, there would be little harm in a three, six month delay. Whereas on the other hand, my oncology practice probably like Lori's remained quite busy and actually I remained um, seeing patients because unfortunately many of those patients with advanced disease don't didn't have providers at home where they could travel to and even get care locally. So our oncology practice was actually quite busy. So for low risk patients, we were able to defer their follow-up. And now as Mayo Clinic has ramped up and we're, you know, once again, 150% um, working, you know, we've made up and seen many of these patients and we've been able to um, bring patients back safely um, with safe protocols. So I think that's been reassuring for patients. And with the ability to reach out virtually to patients, sometimes patients have come in gotten their imaging, they might not have been able to see me same day, but then I get a virtual visit with them a week or two weeks later. So um, I think our low risk patients have been really satisfied and, and been reassured that we're able to still manage them. We sometimes get imaging locally and we have them send the image to us. So with technology, I actually think um, we've made great progress in being able to reach patients across uh, different parts of the country. Dr. Rory, what do you think from a surgical perspective? Sure. Um, you know, I echo, echo a lot of what Dr. Ryder has said. Um, we also evolved as, the, as, we, as we started to learn more about this virus. In the beginning, you know, as most of the country, uh, we shut down our operating rooms and basically only very emergent patients um, could get operated on. And that did include advanced thyroid cancer patients, but almost everybody else, lower thyroid cancer, non-cancerous non tumors of the thyroid, adrenal parathyroids, they were all put on hold um, for a couple of months actually, until we could get all the protocols in place and all the testing in place. And I think now we at UCLA, just like many of the major centers and probably most of the hospitals in the country um, have really safe protocols to the point where it's, it's very safe to come into the hospital, to come into the clinic. Um, I think the protocols are really important though. So knowing what your physician offices and your hospitals are doing to protect you and to protect others um, is really important. So everybody, you know, universal masking, um, uh, constant cleaning. I mean, we did this all the time in the operating room. We always clean very heavily between the patients, but you know how we deal with the ventilators. Um, and so now we're actually doing every 
type of thyroid cancer surgery from the very low, lowest risk surgeries to the very highest uh, risk surgeries. Now, does that mean that everybody's coming? No, <laughs> sometimes people will be sitting because you know, we're the end of the line. So if they're not referred, because maybe they've had a discussion with Dr. Ryder um, that says, you know what, we're just gonna watch this for a little while, um, then that's fine. You know, I think it's, uh, you know, they, they, but if they end up coming and seeing me or seeing any surgeons uh, for that matter, um, we have a discussion like we would normally, except for now everybody's in a mask. So it's a little bit, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's a disconnect and I, I miss that connection that I have with patients. And so I too do for, perform a lot of video visits. Um, we did, we've been doing that for a few years actually. So we just ramped it up. A lot of the times it can be the initial consultation and make sure that the, all the workup is done before they actually see me right before the surgery. Um, but all my post-op visits, I do almost all of them um, on video. So at least at one point I do get to see them in person or you know face to face. But um, we've learned a lot more about the virus. We test, so this is something to, to, that's important is that all, all our patients are tested within 48 hours of, of having surgery uh, for COVID. So if you are COVID positive, you are not going to get an operation that will be delayed um, because the risk of um, something happening to you is much higher if you're COVID positive and you, and you undergo surgery than if you're COVID negative. Now, could there be false negative? Sure, but our testing is pretty sensitive at this point. So um, that's sort of one of the things that we use in the protocols um, uh, besides all the other things that I've mentioned. Perfect. Lori? So I don't really have too much to add. However, I, you know, this is a, a bit of a tangent, but I think important. So one of the things that we've worried about a lot is that our patients in oncology are going to get um, more cases of COVID and have more serious infections. Um, and in general, it's we've actually been reassured by the studies that have been done so far. There are a couple of cancer subtypes like people who have leukemia, um, people who are on chemotherapy that makes their white blood cell count go very low, or people with lung can primary lung cancer um, are at an increased risk with COVID-19. But we haven't seen that um, so far in people with diagnoses like thyroid cancer and also people who are on medication uh, for thyroid cancer treatment, including the TKIs um, in terms of the increased risk of infection or increased risk of serious infection. Um, so that's um, been um, a bit of a relief. Um, however, that doesn't mean that COVID-19 is not real um, and not a real threat for all of us, as it still is, unfortunately. But, but, it, but it has been reassuring that oncology has been able to do oncology through this and with appropriate care, been able to do it. I mean, that's that's an important message to get out. Yep, absolutely. Um, Mabel, let me give you one of my, uh, the questions I always try to dodge the most, uh, which is this issue of uh, some surgeon at UCLA took my thyroid out, um, and now I don't feel good. Um, that I've, I'm, you, I've been patient with you. You've had me on thyroid hormone. I've tried tyrosin. I've tried everything I could imagine. Um, you know, I, I say it in jest, but it's obviously real, right? I mean, I mean, patients, many patients don't feel well after that. How, how do you deal with that when they come talk to you and about combination therapy and arm or thyroid or just acknowledging that this is real? Can you talk a little bit? How do you deal with that in clinic? Yeah, I think um, these are, this is a challenge. And that's why when a patient is undergoing surgery before their surgery, we, especially now with the ability to do lobectomy as opposed to near total um, thyroidectomy, these kinds of um, experiences that we all have had from patients with across the whole spectrum, whether you're an endocrine or oncology or as a surgeon that you hear from patients. And I certainly think I've had young patients come back after you know otherwise healthy who don't feel well. And I think there is something to this. Um, the question is how to manage it. And I think these are very complex um, and challenging discussions with patients. And so um, I think one is starting out before the surgery, most importantly, to talk with them about expectations, asking about their energy, um, about how they feel beforehand, because often things get attributed to them, everything in life after thyroidectomy and it becomes the thyroid must be the source. So when we talk about thyroid um, hormone levels and assess them, you know, there was a time where endocrine really didn't consider T3 replacement or the um, armor thyroid or combination, but with data coming out that not everybody may feel the same um, or not may, everybody may even have um, conversion of T4 to T3 um, as effectively, 
and with just quality of life improvements that many people like Megan Haymart are working on, I think many of us are becoming open to combinations of T4, T3, but importantly in a safe manner, whether that's an armor thyroid or whether that's in adjusting levothyroxine and adding Cytomel, emphasizing the importance of TSH levels and doing it in a safe manner. So I think we're making progress in that area. And at Mayo, we have a chronic fatigue clinic where it's a multidisciplinary clinic. And you know, I think as um, wellness really um, is becoming emphasized across the spectrum of many diseases, including cancer, it's an opportunity to talk to patients about diet and exercise. I think we spend a lot of time talking just about thyroglobulin levels, ultrasound, surgeries, levothyroxine. And there's very good outcomes now on patients with cancer who do exercise and who do um, have low to no sugar intakes have improved outcomes and quality of life may actually be good. So I think this is an opportunity to um, uh, start those conversations with patients and we may not be able to resolve their fatigue or know what the exact cause is, but there are important steps that we can take to help improve their quality of life. I mean, I think the most important things we've all finally recognized it exists, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. 20 years ago, we were acting like it didn't exist. This is a yeah. real thing. And exactly. it, it does it does seem like to me that people are really taking it a better interest, doing more research for the first time, instead of just pretending everybody's crazy that has that. Yeah. Um, Dr. Wright, um, let's talk about a surgical issue. Um, many of my patients that come back and see me, particularly after you've done total and like a lateral neck dissection, talk about this tightness that they have in the neck um, that feels everything's really tight. Um, you know, or sometimes they have to concentrate to swallow to get food to go down the right direction. Um, is that an expected outcome? Or, and how long does that last? What do you tell people about that? I think in general, you have an inflammation in your neck that's going to affect the way you swallow. So even people who have giant goiters who have difficulty swallowing just from the goiter, I always tell them, okay, this you might still have a little bit of an issue swallowing for the first couple of months after surgery just because of all the inflammation and your whole your larynx is kind of shifting back to normal. With thyroid cancer, um, it's similar. You, you, have a, you have an extensive dissection, especially a lateral neck dissection. Everything is going to be really inflamed. That's including your larynx and that's where your swallowing muscles come from back there in the back of your throat where your esophagus is. It's located right behind your trachea, but, it's, it, but the thyroid is frequently uh, adherent to the to the esophagus. So you have to dissect it off the esophagus many times. And sometimes some cancers invade the esophagus and we have to take a little layer of the esophagus off. So the inflammation itself will persist a few weeks up to a few months after the surgery. I also, on top of that, may put some gel foam that's like this dissolvable foam that goes in sort of in the central neck area uh, and it has thrombin on, in it, which can help prevent bleeding. Um, and so that too can feel kind of like a pressure in the neck and that usually resolves within a few weeks um, as well. So I just tell people, hang tight, let the healing, let your body do the healing. And then, you know, we can discuss, you know, if, it, if it's persistent past a few months, but uh, usually it's not. Yeah. So we, we normalize it. We know it's going to, does stretching or massage or yoga or anything yeah. like that help? So um, one thing after surgery, so especially if you're doing a lateral neck dissection, then you've probably been in there four, five, six hours, sometimes seven hours, depending on the lateral, lateral neck. So your neck muscles are going to be super tight after that. So what, what I tell my patients is, you know, even before we roll back to the operating room, make sure you're moving your neck around. Um, you know, don't keep it stiff after the surgery because that makes it worse. The muscles will tighten up and stay tight. So it's like moving it around should be fine, should be safe. The only thing I probably wouldn't do is like, literally, just because <laughs> But everything please, else. Please don't mess up my pretty scar. Yeah, I know. Don't, don't rip the incision up. But, but you can do it really, really gent gently. Heating pads are fine. You can do that. Sometimes I, I recommend that. Um, I usually wait, you know, this is surgeon specific, but I usually wait on ibuprofen or anti-inflammatories anti, anti for about three days, just because it, it's a, it promotes bleeding. We stop it about a week before surgery also. Um, but any, you know, Tylenol, Vicodin, whatever you're taking after the surgery can also help. And then just, just moving it around. I agree that that helps a lot. Massaging, sometimes a scar is kind of stiff and you're, and, and, and there's definitely a natural healing ridge that happens a lot of times. And that usually will go away on its own. But if you want to help it along, you can massage it through. And sometimes that helps break up the scar a little. That's fantastic. Uh, Dr. Ryder, a couple of questions about lobectomy. 
Um, you know, we're doing more lobectomies these days than we've ever done before. We're kind of swinging back in. And uh, the question is, if you do a lobectomy, isn't that other side of the thyroid going to have to work harder? And does that put it at increased risk of having maybe thyroid nodules, maybe thyroid cancer? So wh what do you tell people about that half a thyroid you left behind and potentially yeah. their need for thyroid hormone therapy? Yeah. So in patients, when we counsel them about one of the benefits of lobectomy, we do remind patients that even though that other thyroid lobe on ultrasound may look completely normal um, and has no nodules, there's at least a, a one in four chance or 25% chance, we quote them, that lobectomy and isthmusectomy, usually half of the isthmus is removed, that they may require um, thyroid hormone replacement. And I actually often quote it or say it as a supplement. And I clarify, I don't mean that your thyroid, when I mean supplement, I don't mean over the counter. I do mean a prescription levothyroxine, but because, but it's your other lobe is not a hundred percent in one out of four cases. So the TSH we may see rise just a little bit after surgery from one to two range up to you know, five to 10, or even sometimes 11 to 12 range. And for me, that usually means that the thyroid, that other lobe is working maybe 50, 60, 70%, but it's just not a hundred percent. So we add levothyroxine and I usually add doses 75 to hundred micrograms um, to keep the, uh, help ensure that the TSH comes to normal. And sometimes you can predict this if they have a family history of autoimmune thyroid disease, or if on the ultrasound, you can see a pattern that looks like thyroiditis or Hashimoto's, you can say, you know, I think you might have a higher risk, or if before surgery, their TSH is already sort of in the fives or six range, you can predict that they'll um, probably need um, some thyroid supplement or replacement after surgery. And so usually when I see them back, it's about four to six weeks after surgery. And so we'll be able to determine how that lobe is working um, at that initial visit. Those are great. Lori, there's a question here about liquid biopsies and are we really using them and who uses them and kind of in what settings? So can you tell us what the heck a liquid biopsy is and how that might be helpful to you? So liquid biopsies are, um, uh, I think, um, being uh, used more in thyroid cancer now. And I think that we are seeing some emerging data um, regarding the utility of liquid biopsies. So the idea of a liquid biopsy is basically taking um, a blood sample um, and then um, extracting circulating tumor DNA from the blood in order to evaluate um, the uh, circulating tumor tumor DNA. So there are now a couple of commercial um, laboratories that provide um, liquid biopsies for patients with cancer. Um, there's an established role for doing liquid biopsies um, in several cancers, including non-small cell lung cancer, um, where um, patients who are on targeted therapy um, may develop um, acquired resistance mutations to the targeted therapy over time. And you can see evidence of the acquisition of these acquired resistance mutations in liquid biopsies in people with non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so now um, we're beginning to look at patients with thyroid cancer and seeing that we don't always find circulating tumor DNA in people, even when we know they have thyroid cancer that hasn't been completely resected. So not every cancer um, sh sheds uh, DNA into the bloodstream as much as, as every other cancer. Um, so, so um, the assays may need to be optimized um, better for thyroid cancer um, in general, um, but um, we can um, measure circulating tumor DNA in some patients. Um, and now that we're using um, gene-specific therapy more often in people with advanced thyroid cancer, um, there certainly is a need to um, look for these um, acquired resistance muta mutations when patients are no longer responding to those therapies. Um, so for example, um, in a thyroid cancer that's driven by a RET alteration, um, we now know that there's at least one acquired resistance mutation that can emerge on RET-specific therapy. Um, and we know that that acquired resistance mutation can be detected in some patients with, by these liquid biopsies. Um, so we are, it's becoming now more standard of care, particularly when people have, um, are on gene-specific therapy for advanced thyroid cancer. 
Um, Mabel, there's a couple questions about radioactive iodine and salivary gland issues. So can you talk a little bit about sort of acute management of the salivary gland issues in the first few days or weeks after radioactive iodine? And then somebody, once they've had that, sometimes years later still gets a little tenderness in there. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, good question. So uh, we typically think that the threshold for the silatinitis or um, inflammation of the sal salivary glands occurs at around a threshold of 75 millicuries of radioactive iodine. So that's the starting point. And really as your cumulative exposure to radioactive iodine goes up, if you receive more than one, two or three treatments, then that cumulative exposure is also important and increases the risk of the silatinitis. And I tell patients that anywhere from one day to one year after this treatment, they may get swelling on one side of their cheek. Um, and then within a few days or um, a week, they can get swelling on the other side. And this is either because the salivary gland itself is swollen and inflamed from that radiation effect, or that the salivary ducts that drain uh, the saliva uh, get closed off. And so that leads to the pain and swelling. So we usually tell patients in the acute phase to massage from their ear to their jaw to sort of milk that gland. They'll sometimes feel um, or taste as something sour or um, salty in their mouth when they do that. We tell them um, ibuprofen um, for anti-inflammation tends to work um, really well. And then to stay really well hydrated and sometimes to chew on sour candies to help sort of uh, stimulate salivary flow. Um, if that's happened in most patients, it does resolve to normal salivary function, but in a, a one or 2%, they may get permanent dry mouth. And certainly if they've had it once, if they get retreated with radioactive iodine, certainly they're at risk of subsequent um, uh, issues. So Dr. Harari, um, as long as we're talking about complications, um, voice issues after thyroid surgery. So not the permanent ones, the temporary ones that folks often get after you've had to do a central neck dissection, you know, they, they, they see me a couple weeks after surgery, it's still a little bit hoarse, but you know, you guys are always very reassuring. What, what's the natural history of a, a, a nerve that's maybe just a little bit bruised, but not, you know, completely damaged? Sure. Yeah. So the nerve that um, you're referring to is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So just for the audience, I'm sure this audience is very well read. So <laughs> um, this nerve, uh, as you know, anatomically sits uh, basically near the trachea and it's fused to the, uh, to the thyroid. So we have to very carefully dissect uh, the thyroid off the nerve. Sometimes in the operating room, we actually can't dissect the entire thyroid off the nerve without transecting it. So we will leave a little piece of thyroid on the nerve, or sometimes we'll leave a little piece of cancer on the nerve. Sometimes we do have to transect it, and that's very rare. But in the case that Dr. Tuttle was explaining, you know, the more you do to it, the more likely it is that you will have an issue with your voice. Um, if you do a central neck dissection, that you have to skeletonize the nerve, and the nerve is basically adherent to all of those central neck nodes. So it's very, you have to be very careful with it. Um, and let's say after all of that, you do have a nerve dysfunction. It, what that means is that basically each nerve moves your vocal cords. So, you know, your vocal cords are like this, the way we phonate is that it closes, you know, and then it opens and that's how we talk. So if one of the nerves is out or doesn't work very well, your, your, your cords are kind of like, this. They don't completely come together. Sometimes they do. Sometimes the one that isn't working is just like this and you have a normal voice, but usually there's sort of a gap and that causes a breathiness like, a, like this, like a hoarseness kind of breathiness. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. Tuttle's referring to a temporary, what, that, what that's called is a temporary paresis or a temporary paralysis. So paralysis is just, it's not moving. Paresis is just not moving very well. And basically the natural history of that of that is to recover on its own so what that that can vary from person to person it can be two three days it can be weeks it can be months um, we usually call it permanent around six months out sometimes we'll give it up to a year there have been people who up to a year have have recovered um, but sometimes people need their voices to you know, work, uh, their teachers or their lecturers, or they speak on the phone a lot. And so our ENT colleague, we work very care carefully uh, with our, closely uh, with our laryngologists. So they can do temporizing measures to get the, get the cords right back together. 
Um, sometimes it means, you know, injecting one of the cords, making it in the middle so that the other one can, can um, uh, meet it and, and so your voice will be stronger and louder. And that's a temporary injection that kind of goes away while the body is recovering and while the nerve has, has, has started to regain function. So I have a discussion with my patients. If it happens, usually I let it, you know, um, recover on its own. I'd like to not do anything to the cords until until we until about three months out and if that if that's still not is if it's still not recovered by then then we'll start thinking about temporary measures um but um i think that maybe answered the question <laughs> that sounds good um laurie i'm going to come back to you um the, it, it, i want you to tell me a happy story the one of the, one of the questions that was carried over from an earlier session said, uh, "Talk about a successful experience in treating thyroid cancer." I mean, we we focus on what could go wrong. We focus on how we rescue. Um, I knew I was going to ask you that question. And in the chat room, somebody I saw 16 years ago living in San Diego is doing great. I mean, that's my happy story, right? That's awesome. So, um, tell tell us a happy story from I mean, you. You treat some really sick people with some drugs drugs that can be harmful. So t tell me a happy story. Oh, uh, I, have a, a, I have a lot of happy stories. Um, I wish they were all happy stories and of course they're not, but I, I'm gonna tell you one story. So a patient of mine was diagnosed with anaplastic thyroid cancer um, uh, three years ago. Uh, she had unresectable disease. Um, she also had metastasis at the time of diagnosis. She was enrolled on a clinical trial um, and actually responded, um, but developed um, a fistula from the trachea through the skin um, that required a tracheostomy to protect her breathing. It was a devastating uh, complication. She had to come off of the clinical trial for it. And it was awful because she was responding. We enrolled her on another clinical trial of a PD, uh, PD-1 antibody, which is called spartalizumab. It's a typical immune therapy drug, very similar to a drug like Keytruda that's approved for a lot of different types of thyroid cancer. Um, and again, she had a complete response um, to uh, treatment with the spartalizumab drug. Um, she um, was in clinic uh, with me um, now off of spartalizumab for a year after having had a complete response um, um, uh, uh, two years earlier. Um, she was in clinic with me a couple weeks ago. And we were talking about um, the fact that she needs to have a routine colonoscopy. And we were talking about COVID-19 <laughs> precautions. Um, and she's disease-free off of therapy. Um, and I say this because, you know, we um, the diagnosis of anaplastic thyroid cancer is, of course, devastating. Um, but it really is a good example of the fact that with our modern therapies, um, we have made some extraordinary uh, progress in thyroid cancer. Um, the, the progress that we've made, unfortunately, doesn't really apply to everybody, but there are some select cases where we have real home runs. Um, and that this that um, story is, is just one of, of an example of a number of home runs that we've seen um, in my lifetime doing clinical research in advanced thyroid cancer. And there definitely are, we're, there were, we're accumulating these home runs um, and enjoying every one of them. That is awesome. Um, Mabel, there was a question about, we talk so much about genetic testing and BRAF and TERT and RET and all this sort of stuff. Um, the question is, should everybody that has papillary cancer get either, you can talk about the difference between germline and somatic testing, or are you doing it only on select patients? How does the Mayo do that? Yeah, so, um, so when we talk about germline testing, we're talking about checking um, for mutations in the blood for cancers that, uh, thyroid cancers that we think might be hereditary. So the typical example of that, of course, is medullary thyroid cancer, where we do germline testing for RET mutations, because at least 30% of our medullary thyroid cancers are hereditary. Um, aside from that, the majority of differentiated thyroid cancers at least are not hereditary or germline. Um, and so in my endocrine practice, um, in my low risk patients, I rarely um, am doing routine germline test, uh, excuse me, somatic testing. Somatic testing meaning looking at their tumor tissue, looking for mutations um, for their disease. We know from work by my former mentor, Jim Fagan, and the thyroid cancer um, genomic studies that have been done that we now know the mutations in really 95% of papillary thyroid cancers. And work from Jim um, there at Memorial and others have also clarified mutations in advanced and anaplastic thyroid cancer. So we have identified a lot of them. 
And in most of those for um, low risk patients who have no evidence of disease, there really is limited benefit um, clinically from genomic testing of what drives their tumor. And the majority of that we know is BRAF. On the other hand, in my oncology practice, when I joined that practice at Mayo, um, we barely early on started doing um, somatic tumor tissue testing. Um, because in oncology, when we see patients with advanced disease that has failed radioactive iodine, whether they're indolent or slowly progressing disease or look like they're gonna be more advanced disease, we wanna know what are all our options for treatments. And while we do have linbatinib and um, as first line treatment, and it is quite effective, not everybody does respond or tolerate that treatment. And we do know that eventually patients will progress on their first line treatment. And so what gives me great ease when I see my patients is to know that in their tumor tissue, they may have a BRAF mutation or a RET fusion or a rare ALK fusion or even rare RET fusions. When, if they have those um, fusions available, it's actually guided sometimes even first line treatment. So I have an 85 year old homesteader from Alaska who I was fortunate to find a RET fusion on and she has been on um, cell percatinib clinical trial now for over a year and has had a near complete response if not a complete response with almost no side effects. And in this particular patient, we elected to put her on this trial without radioactive iodine even or linbatinib, and it's been a game changer for her. So we are now routinely doing genomics in all our oncology patients, whether we think they may need treatment within the next six months or within the next six years. It's, it's amazing as I look back over 20 or 30 years of doing this, these, these stories just weren't there 20 years ago. Yeah. Glory. This yeah. is an amazing story. Um, let me give each of you one minute. We will assign you one minute um, and we'll go around the horn. We always start with surgeons because we respect surgeons. G give me your one minute take home for the entire crowd. Um, the most important concepts, the most important topics, new information. If you had one minute to do an elevator pitch, go. Tell me what you're thinking. Um, okay, so I would say that um, most important is to find a surgeon that is very experienced in this type of surgery. I think your 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 um, risks will will be less in, in regards to your surgical surgical risks. Um, super important to make sure that you have the preoperative imaging that kind of uh, lays out your disease prior to the surgery, so you get the right surgical treatment. Um, and then uh, surgeons that are you know, up to date with the recent guidelines, like we were talking about active surveillance, lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy, having those kind of discussions with you. So I think um, a lot of really good things that we've covered um, uh, and I'm, I'm honored to be on this panel. Thank you so much for having me. Fantastic, Lori, one minute. I wasn't unmuted, I wasn't ready. Um, <laughs> So I, I just just to build on on uh, Dr. Ryder's comments on um, the role for genomic testing in patients with advanced thyroid cancer, there is a I think a role for for genomic testing in every patient with advanced thyroid cancer, whether it's uh, differentiated thyroid cancer, poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, anaplastic thyroid cancer, or medullary thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer is actually the poster child for um, uh, alterations that can be targeted with new targeted therapies. Thyroid cancer has um, more actionable fusions than any other solid tumor that we know of in adults. And so if it makes sense to do genomic testing in patients with lung cancer, looking for a, a small percentage of patients with lung cancer for whom targeted therapy is a, a good treatment option, it certainly makes sense for people with advanced thyroid cancer. The other thing I would like to say is um, for all of those patients out there who participate in clinical trials, you guys are the ones that have really um, changed the landscape of therapies for all of the other people that you know and love for um, who have thyroid cancer and the contributions that our patients make when they participate in clinical trials is huge. And, um, and I don't think that we recognize the contributions that our patients make often enough. So so for all of you out there who, who've been, uh, uh, been clinical trial participants, you guys are amazing. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me. That's awesome, Lori. Okay, Mabel, take us home. Okay. So I have the fortune of being in a field where I treat uh, the spectrum of thyroid cancer from the lowest risk disease to the most advanced, uh, including anaplastic thyroid cancer. And I think today from what, um, where I stand, we've made tremendous progress in 
the lowest risk disease with Dr. Harari and our um, surgical colleagues doing the appropriate surgery for low risk patients and minimizing sort of some of the um, uh, risk and quality of life um, issues that many patients face. So I think we as a, a, a team of endocrine oncology specialists of all stakeholders are doing, uh, have, are improving the care and quality of life for our patients. And at the other extreme, um, it's, uh, really gratifying within oncology to see the advanced treatments that we're now able to offer patients that we didn't have 10 years ago when I started doing this. And to see these success stories that Lori talks about um, really are accumulating and are increasing. And I think for a patient with thyroid cancer then to have the right team in place with the expertise to know how less aggressive to be and then how more aggressive to be and fortunately with genomics to have now a menu of potential options to choose from, you know, really requires this expert team that fortunately now with the ability to do virtual consults and reach providers across uh, different places is a nice opportunity for patients with multiple levels of thyroid cancer. Fantastic. Thank all three of you for just willing to take any question that came down the pike. You did a great job. Pam, I'll turn the session back over to you to finish. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you too for all of our participants. Um, we've had a lot of people join us uh, for all of our FICA sessions over the last three days. So again, thank each and every one of you for attending and thank you for our wonderful doctors um, who are here to present and provide us with such wonderful, useful information. And we hope to see you all next year.